Hello everyone, I'm Randy Pettit. Some call me racing's greatest showman, and I'm called other stuff too. But listen, we're here today, we are talking some Bowman Gray Stadium racing with one of the iconic first families of Bowman Gray racing, the Robertson family. Well, since we last cranked a motor at historic Bowman Gray Stadium back in, wow, 2019, uh, this summer it'll be two years, uh, 2020 was the first time since World War II that they did not race at Bowman Gray, and Bowman Gray has been NASCAR sanctioned since 1949. It's the oldest weekly NASCAR track in the country, and that's the first season they didn't run since World War II. And since that time, we have lost in our extended Bowman Gray Stadium family, we've lost some really good ones. We've lost some great fans, some great sponsors, team members, and of course some really good drivers. One of the drivers that we lost during that time was uh, Gerald Robertson. And Gerald is the father of these two men right here, grandfather of these two guys. And Gerald was always one of my favorites. Uh, I grew up in the same neighborhood as these guys back when we were younger. And I remember he was just a guy that loved to go to Bowman Gray Stadium and race. And he was a guy that struggled to get to the racetrack, but he was going to get there no matter what and be a part of it. And he did that for decades. And I'm going to let these guys talk more about their dad in a moment. But I wanted to share with some of the younger fans that Gerald Robertson was a part of Bowman Gray Stadium Racing. He had uh, 152 starts in the modified division. That's the premier division at Bowman Gray Stadium. And Gerald tried for many, many years, and he came close a few times, but he never quite toted that checkered flag at the Madhouse until in later years he reinvented himself in the four-cylinder, what we now call stadium stock division, and Gerald had 179 stadium stock starts, five wins at the Madhouse, 116 top 10 finishes out of those 179 starts. And folks, they draw for their starting position almost all the time. He had to start in the back a lot, he'd drive his way toward the front. And he is eighth all time in top 10 finishes in the stadium stock division. There's been a ton of great drivers in that division. So we wanted to open the show by talking about Gerald Robertson. And uh, I want to start with you, Mike Robertson. Mike himself, a great racer at the Madhouse. Uh, Mike had 198 starts. Uh, and, and you may race some more, so I'm not, I'm not calling you retired just yet. 198 starts at the Madhouse, 15 wins. And out of those 198 starts, he had 60 top five finishes. He was knocking on the door quite a bit. 131 top 10 finishes. And Mike, you got started at Bowman Gray in the division that your dad ended with, and that's the stadium stock division. We called it the Buzz Bombers when it first came out, and you were, you were part of the original gang, if my memory serves correct. 40 starts in that division, eight wins, and 18 top five finishes in the four cylinder class, we'll call it at Bowman Gray. So let's start out by talking about your dad. Uh, growing up, how old were you when you remember your dad going to Bowman Gray Stadium? I was probably uh, as young as I had a memory. Um, you know, I tell everybody about my dad. Uh, obviously, losing him has been a, been a struggle for all of us. But my dad raced, and before he ever took a checkered flag, he raced 30 years before wow. that day. That's 30 years. 30 years. There ain't many people going to try to win a football game or a basketball game and go 30 years without reaching that pinnacle of a victory. So, um, you know, that was the uh, that was the thing that he taught us early on. Uh, me and Bryant, we, we noticed it when he was running modifieds that, you know, he would take people's um, used tires and, and race with. Um, just uh, he loved the sport, wanted to be a part of it. Dad led three races coming off number four. He would always spin out, going to the checker, three races. Wow, in a that's got to be heart-wrenching, not only for him, but for the family sitting there in the stands or in the pits well, watching that. Well, I used that. to ride home with him every night. It was just me and him, we, and we would get to Kermit's and take the left on Walltown, and he would always look at me and say, we'll get them next week. So... I mean, if he could say that, I guess you learned to take it in stride, didn't you? Yeah, he uh, remarkable man and uh, learned so much from him uh, and miss him. Absolutely. And on my, on my far right here and to your left, uh, we've got Bryant Robertson. And Bryant, one of the Robertson brothers, and I said, just you two brothers, is that right? We have yes. a sister. And you got a sister. Got I a met sister. your sister. Okay. Now, Bryant, uh, I'm going to give everybody your stats here real quick. You raced in three different divisions at Bowman Gray. 
Uh, stadium stock, it we now call you had 20 starts, five top t top five finishes, and out of those 20 starts, you were in the top 10 14 times, which is pretty good because usually 15, 20 cars out there, you're drawing for your position. Uh, didn't have quite as much success when you stepped up the street stock. You had 18 starts, three top fives, and you were telling me earlier a lot of times being following in Mike's footsteps, a lot of times your car, you would get the car, kind of the leftover car, but hey, you know, you got the race, so that's pretty right. cool. Uh, and then you made your way up to Sportsman, that's where you got uh, your first uh, checkered flag at the Madhouse, won twice, uh -huh. and you know, there's a lot of people watching this would give their right arm or left arm to get a win at Bowman Gray, so right. congratulations on those two wins, and I can't remember if I was there for either one of them, but I know I remember seeing you run up front quite a bit, 18 top five finishes, 61 times in the top 10 in Sportsman. Uh, that's no slouch. And now these days you're running one of the uh, one of the uh, 602 type modifieds and enjoying your driving career doing that. And you've got a really neat place here, Turn and Burn. We'll give you a minute to talk about that. But let's talk about your dad for a minute. Uh, what are some of your memories growing up of your dad racing at Bowman Gray? Well, I mean, basically it's the same thing as my brother was talking about. I, I raced for quite a few years before I ever won too. So, I mean, I kind of knew how Going through what I went through, and, and the thing Dad always told me is, you know, if, if this is what you want to do, don't stop. And uh, he told me it was going to come, and sure enough, in 2010, uh, we actually, like I said in the past, we uh, we were running some older stuff, and then in 2010, uh, my brother kind of helped me a little bit, and we actually had uh, Bubba Gale from uh, Gale Force oh, yeah, come on yeah. board. And, Very uh, good chassis guy. Awesome. And he changed everything on my car and uh, put us in probably the best car I'd ever sit down in. And of course we won twice that year. That's and, awesome. Uh, that year and in 2011 and 12, we were, uh, we led the points three years in a row uh, for over a half of the seasons. That's that's pretty so awesome. We uh, we changed it around and then dad always, you know, had my back and always, you know, I knew if I could call him on Sundays, he was gonna tell me what I'd done right and I'd done wrong. So. Yeah, not necessarily uh, in that order, right? No, no, <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah. Um, We've also got uh, Mike, your, your two boys here, uh, Ryan Robertson. And Ryan, I haven't watched as many of your races because you did a lot of your career when I was away doing other things like the Hooters Pro Cup Series and working at other tracks. But uh, 129 starts at the Madhouse, according to my count. Six victories in Sportsman, um, 39 top five finishes. And out of 129 starts, you were in the top 10 79 times. That's pretty stout. And you always seem to have beautiful race cars. And, man, you guys had some great sponsors, too. You had some really cool sponsors on your cars. Yeah, I was, I was able to stand on the shoulders of these guys. Um, so I was able to reap the benefits from all the struggle and the pain that they went through uh, to give us good equipment. So when, when I see the stats and I hear about that, man, I can only think that I had the easy job. Those guys, um, to give me the greatest stuff that I had to be able to win and have those stats, is I, I have to attribute that to them. Now, what do you remember about your grandfather uh, the first time you went racing at Bowman Gray? Maybe uh, he was uh, he was there for that first win, wasn't he? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was there. Um, he after, was probably pretty tickled, wasn't he? Oh, he was. Yes, sir. After every race, I would go up in the stands, and he'd be up there watching me on the race, and he would give, you know, he would critique and tell me how good I'd done, um, and I really miss that. Yeah. We're going to miss him. Absolutely. I'll second that. And this young man right here, he is currently, I believe, a sophomore in high school. That's right. And when you got started, you were just 14 years old. This is Chase Robertson, and Chase is part of the uh, sportsman division at Bowman Gray currently when we crank him back up. Chase, uh, you've had 21 starts in a sportsman car by my count one top five finish, 14 top tens. That's pretty amazing for a guy 14, 15 years old to get out there with big grown men like these guys and, and rumble with these guys. I think that's a terrific start to your career. Uh, tell me about that first season of racing at Bowman Gray and the time you got spent with your grandfather when he'd come to the track to, to watch you. Yeah, um, I, the first season was uh, pretty good. We finished six in points and um, uh, I learned a lot, but I do miss going up after the races and talking to grandpa. He, uh, he did critique me a few times after the races, and I'm going to miss that. Now, when you first got out there, you had some pretty big shoes to fill. You know, your grandfather had raced at Bowman Gray on and off for decades. Your dad, your uncle, part of the Bowman Gray family for, for a couple decades or more as well. And wow, here, and, then you, and then Ryan, and now here you go. Was there any pressure on you, man? I mean... A lot of wins, a lot of experience between these three guys. What, what was it like kind of getting in that car so young 
and having that legacy to, to, to have to fall into? Yeah, it was definitely big shoes, but I knew um, if I just listened to all three of them, I could, I could do pretty good. And um, I just asked all of them for advice, and uh, it helped most of the time. Uh, folks, you're watching Rattling the Roll Cage. I'm the host, Randy Pettit, and with me, we have got Bryant and Mike Robertson. They are brothers, and then the sons of Mike Robertson. We got Chase and Ryan here right beside them. We hope you can hear us. We, we got more people than we got microphones, but there's a couple of us here pretty loud, not to name any names, so I think we'll be fine. So if, you, if you're getting one of us loud, a little quieter, just remember, we're, we're still fine-tuning on this thing, getting it perfect. I want to give a shout-out to our producer. He's my friend Lee Craft. And Lee is the host of Monday Morning Racer on YouTube. I hope you'll check out his channel. And he's got over 200 videos, a little bit of everything on there, from micro midgets to modifieds and the NHRA top field dragsters, interviews with some of the top stars in the sport. Check it out, Monday Morning Racer on YouTube. Hit that subscribe button. And you've already subscribed to my channel. You were one of the first people to push the button. I want to thank you for that. And Mike, we were talking about this off the camera. You know, this is just something that I started this year I wanted to do to keep the conversation going about, you know, grassroots racing in our area here in Central North Carolina, Bowman Gray, Ace, Caraway, all the different tracks in our area. Uh, the, the, you know, this is going to be a lot of fun when we get these shows edited and the fans can check it out. We've got a lot of great fans in the area. Most definitely. And uh, obviously with your uh, style and personality as the greatest showman in racing, I mean, it's just, uh, it's destined to, uh, to carry on what Bowman Gray brings to us during the summer where Randy can come through in, in odd months and, and keep the conversation going. And uh, it's going to be exciting. I'm, I'm glad to be a part of it and, and thank Randy for inviting our family here and, uh, and, and look forward to all the, uh, the people that he's going to bring. And some, you know, I've heard some of the names that he has mentioned and, and being myself, being the oldest, I've seen, you know, I've been at Bowman Gray since I was born, so I mean, I remember all the old timers, and uh, you know we're losing them yeah. uh, faster than than I would like, and uh, to, to hear their stories is uh, it's pretty remarkable to bring back that that era. And on that note, we want to dedicate this show to to anybody that's watching out there. If if you had a family member that loved Bowman Gray Stadium, and and we lost them during this pandemic, or or maybe prior to it. We, our heart goes out to you. You know, the way I always look at it, Mike and Bryant and guys, you know, Bowman Gray, we, we don't always see eye to eye on everything, but it's like one great big dysfunctional family is what I like to call it. <laughs> and we got the drivers, we got their teams, we got the sponsors, people run the racetrack, and most importantly, we got those fans. So anybody that's watching out there, whether you're a fan, if you drove in the past, been a crew member, a sponsor, connected with our family in any way, and you're suffering a loss, we, our heart goes out to you. And this show is dedicated to you and the memory of Gerald Robertson and all the great people of Bowman Gray Stadium Racing that we have lost since we last cranked a motor uh, in 2019. And our hearts are with you, our thoughts are with you, and we're going to keep talking up racing until we get back out there and crank them up. And Bryant, you've... Uh, you kind of shifted gears a little bit with your racing career here as of late. You have went from the sportsman car into a modified. What was it like getting behind the wheel of a modified? You were the first of the family here, if I remember, to get in a modified, correct? No, actually, no? I Mike had one. had one, and he drove, and then Ryan drove. I didn't know that. Where'd you yeah, guys was, run the modified? We ran it at Elkin, and I ran it some on the old Smart Tour. I was okay. terrible. I was terrible. <laughs> okay. I was terrible. We'll forget about it. Then. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, dr driving the modified, what was the biggest thing you had to get used to? And you can talk about it too, Mike, about driving that modified after driving the defender cars. Well, I mean, it's a big difference. When, when you're looking out the windshield, all you see is a big tire and a big air filter. That's that's yeah. all you see. Yeah. And uh, it, it took a little bit to get used to. Uh, we took it to the stadium when we first got it. And uh, I went out there on the, the tires that we actually run the tour with. And that was a big mistake. Uh, every lap I spun it around. Oh, wow. So uh, we put some F45s on it and actually done pretty decent with it. But uh, it was definitely getting some used to it because uh, I never drove anything like it, but once I'd done it, it was the, the most fun I'd ever had inside of a race car. It was the biggest adrenaline rush I've ever had inside of a I've race. driven one one time, and thank you, Junior Miller. I say that every time I bring it up, but, and I drove the, you know, the ones with the, you know, the frontline NASCAR spec motor, I mean, all the horsepower, and this was a winning car that Junior had, and he let me, you probably were there that morning, I hopped in that thing, and it was a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. I'll never forget, I've told the story many times, I can't tell, first time I stepped on the gas, 
it pinned the back of my neck against that headrest. I couldn't move. I was like, damn, I love this. I could see why guys get hooked on it so much. Yeah. Uh, what's your plans for, uh, for this season? Um, any, any chance at all of you changing the motor out in that thing and hopping in it over at the Madhouse and, you know, trying to put your name in the, in the modified record book, something your dad was not right. able to do, and so far none of these guys have either? Well, I mean, me and my brother talked about it uh, not long ago, as a matter of fact, uh, possibly looking at maybe finding the motor and, and doing some, you know, swapping around on it. Uh, don't really know where I'm going to head with it just as of now, the car sitting there, and uh, it basically it just needs a motor in it and gotcha. I can take it anywhere I want but uh to do that you know I would ask basically say I've started all four divisions at Bowman Gray so, and very uh, few people can say right. that and so, so far nobody has won in four different divisions right. we may find a uh a stadium stock ride for uh Ricky Gregg and let him go out there and win that B race one night and Ricky could be the first guy because he's won in Blunderbuss and he's won in street and won in sportsman and tried for many years to win and modified and just couldn't quite get it done. But he's probably been the closest guy to do it, I would say. Well, I still have my stadium car also. And, gotcha. Uh, it's still it's sitting on jack stands. It's re uh, basically ready to go somewhere, too. Well, I want to race this year, so we might work that out <laughs> when we, we turn the camera off. Uh, Ryan, you were, you were part of the Madhouse for a pretty good while, almost 200 starts. And then, um, I'm, let me find my notes here, I'm sorry, 129 starts. And you did some racing outside of Bowman Gray, too, and had some success. Talk about that a little bit. Where were some of your favorite places that you raced? I know the fans at the Madhouse make it fun, but, you know, it's such a tight track, it's really hard to, to, to pass. You get on these bigger tracks, you, you can do a little bit more navigating. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so Bowman Gray was probably the, the toughest track for me to get used to, especially driving there uh, for my first season. It was definitely a challenge. But my favorite racetrack, I would have to say, would be Concord. Okay. Hands down. The trioval? Yeah, I really Did I you really... see the picture on Facebook the other day of the backhoe tearing the asphalt up? Man, what a shame. I think that was on the quarter mile though. I don't think they were on the half mile okay. yet. Okay. Okay, yeah. so there's still uh, it's hope. coming. He actually yeah. won the last race at Concord. Wow. It was the I didn't last know that. Win. That's awesome, yeah. man. So that's a trivial question. If it does become a uh, you know, double wide park or an apartment complex or condos, you'll you'll go down in history, right? Yeah, yeah. sure, yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Now, I understand, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you've kind of decided to step away from driving for a while and kind of focus on your career. Is that correct? Yes, that is. And um, People don't understand how much work it is uh, to work on these race cars. It's, it's like another full-time job, isn't it? Yeah, so I was very fortunate to be able to have uh, and to go the places that I have. And now that my little brothers came along, I don't have the, the pressure to keep things going. So I'm able to turn everything over to him and focus on different aspects of my life. That's a pretty good life. big brother you got there, <laughs> <Yeah>. man. <laughs> so I really enjoy watching him. I have just as much fun watching him race as I do. So, and he's a much better driver than I am. He, he had- All right, uh, he, you heard it here first. He, he's, he's had a lot of good stuff. Um, you know, there's so much technology has changed from the time that I started racing to where he's at. So he's able to utilize some tools that I wasn't able to. So for me to be able to step back and to give him everything, if this is what he wants to do, then I want him to be able to have everything that I have because I know my father sacrificed a lot to put me in the positions that I have. So if I can do my part, then that's kind of what I want to do. Chase, you were 14 years old. I didn't know you were 14 until your mom and dad came up and told me, he's, come on, Randy, talk, talk him up. He's only 14 years old. And I was like, wow, I didn't know that. 14 years old, you put that helmet on, drive drive off of, uh, you know, the, the uh, pit area of Bowman Gray and, you go through those, that opening in the guardrail and pull out there and you look out the windshield and it's a sea of people, man. They're everywhere. The bright lights up there and everybody's watching you. What, what was that first <laughs> night like? What do you uh, remember about it? I remember uh, I had butterflies in my stomach. I I'll was bet. so nervous. Um, I, I, I was, I think I told dad on the radio, um, I don't know how this is gonna go, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it was it was definitely nerve wracking the first time I ever went out there. And you were the youngest in the family to get going, right? I, I don't think anybody else got well, going. Well, we started Ryan testing over there when he was fourteen. Okay, 15. so he got and, a pretty, and Ch okay. We took Chase over, in, you know, when he was a little younger. But Chase had runs, you know, on the six hundred two tour, and you know, so you had some seat time. Yeah. Oh yeah, and I I wasn't apprehensive about putting him out there, uh, not one bit. I mean, his his I, ability. I, I say it. 
every time I get out there and announce the sportsman division, yeah. it would be the main event anywhere in anywhere, America. Anywhere. anywhere in America, puts on some of the best racing anywhere in the country. And I know, folks, I've been to, I've been all around the country. I've announced uh, thousands of races, uh, you know, 110 different venues. And well, there's only one Bowman Gray Stadium. And those sportsman guys put on a show. So well, we what, learned. Yeah, we learned. Yeah. And one of the things that I told Chase that we had learned through Brian, myself, experience, and then with Ryan, is as a rookie, you gotta you gotta give more than you take. Yeah, that's how you earn their respect over it. Cause they will eat you up and they will spit yes, they you will. out and they will make you work on your car seven days a week to get ready for Saturday night. But I told him if they're faster, we're gonna pull over, and that ain't easy to do for a driver. Yeah, but that's how he had their whole season without a DNF, and uh, he earned their respect. I mean, you can ask any sportsman driver over there. And they all love him as a person. Yeah. And that's what I wanted. I wanted him to gain the respect as a human being. Mission accomplished. And, and then the driving aspect, that's not, a, that's not an issue with him. And your dad was refreshing my memory, but you only had one real wreck where you couldn't continue. <laughs> and that was a night. That was a crazy night. Yeah, that's when wreck. it rained. Yeah, what, tell us what happened that night. Uh, I think it was too uh, it was the light. It was, it was too a green light. checker. It yeah. was a green white checkered, and it. Rain. I didn't it know. Raining, I didn't right? know it was raining, and yeah. then I went into uh, uh, one, and it, the car just went Every, sideways. Folks, you cannot <laughs> drive these race cars with slick, slick racing field, tires right. on yeah. the rain. It does not. It does not end, with, end well, does it? Mm -mm, no. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, as a Brian, you know, Ryan, me and Bryant were never. I, I don't consider myself a good race car driver. I got lucky a few times. You uh, fifteen times. Yeah, I think well, I mean, every okay. squirrel finds a nut. Yeah. But, you know, when Ryan came along, we were, we, we had met up with Bubba Gale, and first of all, Todd Hunt has been a tremendous uh, supporter of my family. And and he's been a great friend to ra oh, racing he's, in this he's, area. What period. he's done yeah. for this, you yeah. know, is, is, he's he's in the same category as Bruce Hayes and and Todd Hunt. Those two sponsors have yeah. been tremendous. But um, uh, you know, when when we started, we had we got lucky. Then Chase and Ryan came along, where Ryan was probably the first person to actually run bump stops at Bowman Gray. Ah. And that was when the car was setting so low to the ground back in the, in the late 2008, 2009, when Bubba Gale first came from Alabama here. And uh, I, I'll never forget, Dale Ward was sitting in the stands with me in the NV, or the pits, and, and he's seen that car go through the corner. He said, I've never seen a car go through the corner like that. And, but now it's it's you know everybody yeah. is low and, and so you kind of kind of yeah, started but, the, the but tradition Ryan, if you will. you know Ryan didn't really have the equipment that Chase has got, but Ryan had natural ability also. I mean when he took us to Martinsville and qualified fourth out of a hundred cars on yeah. time. That's get her done right there. I mean on time, and then go to Richmond. There was only one person faster than him, which was Danny Hamlin. I mean, go, I mean, so though he had, and he had good, we had good sponsors back then, and, and Ryan had a face and a name, and he put them all together, and we were able to accomplish a lot with Sheets and Carolina Wood Floors, with Slim State University. I mean, just on and on, but um, Ryan done a tremendous job for us, and for him to pass the torch on to, to Chase, because I couldn't afford it. I mean, you know, this the racing is nine dollars a gallon for fuel now i mean it's just yeah we you know i just i'm at the age now where it's harder to throw money at it right and i can't do it but so much life of, life gets in the way sometimes. Well, i gotta start yeah. thinking about down the road and, yeah. and, and then with chase and then you know ryan brought his team members along now chase has brought his guys along we call them the wally heads I mean, that's their name. Sounds well, like a story there. Oh, they're just, What's the story there? I, they just, we, he I made don't it know up. where we came up with <laughs> it, but it they're up. just okay. tremendous kids. They're, just, they're, they're not only good workers on a race car, they're good people, and I enjoy being around them. And, uh, and, and on that note, I don't want to interrupt you, but yeah. we, we just lost another icon of Bum and Gray sportsman racing, uh, Carl Dink Osborne, and we wanted to you know give a shout out to him and his family and all of his fans. Uh, well, Dink was of one of the many, many Bowman Gray guys. And Dink, you know, Dink he back in the story. day. He was a yeah, character. He was, and one of the things that Dink did that brought that to mind is he had these bunch of Southside kids together. Yeah. And Mark Knott, Mark Stephen Knott, and I know you're watching this, Mark. Mark was one of those kids. And he, he learned, Cook, he learned Bowman Gray Cook, State. Chris Milton, Cook, Tim Cook. Milton. Yeah, and, he and had just, quite a cast yeah, of characters. So that's how it all starts. Somebody 
their friend goes and they go with them and they get interested in it and you get hooked on it, don't you, Bryant Robertson? Your first time at the Madhouse, you remember it? Uh, yeah, I do. <laughs> ah, sounds like a story there. What happened? Well, now the first time was in a, actually Mitch Gale's little four-cylinder car. Okay. 38 car, race. Thomasville, yep. yep. The second time was in Todd Tilly's number nine little Toyota. Okay, yep. Green. Um, yep. A little green car. Yeah. Uh, Don't you say that bad about Todd's car. <laughs> He's watching. Hey, you, uh, work, you work for I, him, I love too. Todd. I love Todd. Uh, Todd was the first, you know, uh, he, he, he came to me and, and told me I could drive his car, and I'd been practicing and testing in my brother's car a couple times, and we went out, green flag fell, and all I know is in the first turn, me and another car had collided, and we went straight into the wall. I mean, I didn't so, even make the first so turn. So you didn't make the first turn. You didn't make the first turn. Not the first turn. In comes but the Amelance. The Amelance comes, <laughs> and there, there is a story behind the Amelance now. <laughs> I, like I said, I love Todd Tilly to death, but oh, the, the, no. oh, the, the harnesses in his car were held in by tie straps. Oh, gosh. Oh, no. So, of course, oh, you no. know, when you hit something and you move, and I'm a, I'm a pretty big old yeah, boy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but now, there again, it was just uh, it was fun, and I don't believe it was that. a learning experience. That's uh, what we call, my friends, redneck engineering. <laughs> that right is there. for sure. Yeah. Uh, but there again, that was just, uh, you know, and Todd's been a part of our family for years. Yeah. Uh, it's helped me, he's helped my brother, uh, and couldn't ask for some better, you know, him and his whole family is great, so. You know, everybody in the YouTube business, including me, including my producer, Lee Craft of Monday Morning Racer, be sure to hit that subscribe button. We're all looking for that one video to go viral for everybody in the world, go, man, check this out, you gotta check this out, yeah. at the water cooler, at work, at home. Well, this guy right over here, Mike hey. Robertson, was the star and one of the most watched videos about Bowman Gray Stadium ever. I think it is Mike, number one. I think it is number one. Yeah. And uh, was this 2012, 13, 14, somewhere along there? 2013. 13, okay, 14. that was my first season back. I think it was 14. It was, it was it one of my first. No, it, well, you're it right, right. It 12, it 13, yeah, yeah 13. It was, 13. it was my first season back yeah. at the Madhouse. I'd have been away a long time. Yeah. Tim McGuire, shout out Tim McGuire. Who was just here earlier, and we, we, uh, my good friend Tim McGuire had finally, after 17 years of setting the bar even higher for me to have to follow behind him, he retired. Yeah. And I was back at the madhouse, and lo and behold, it wasn't too far in the season, and we get, we get a memory that was shared all over the world, Mike. Over the world. From I'm, you correct me if I get any of this wrong, but we were in a I think a twenty lap race or forty lap race. He I can't leading. remember. Okay. I was running second. All right. So Bryant Robertson's leading. Stoltz had won the first race. Right. And he was trying to do the double. He was trying. We had the Madhouse scramble at Birmingham. Ryan Road. was in Ryan was in Las Vegas that weekend for work because I remember getting texts from him. And uh, Derek had, like I said, won the first race. And and folks, for you, if you're not familiar with Bowman Gray, the winner draws a poker chip out of a bag and see they got 8, 10, 12, 14, or 16 on it. That inverts I the field. I think he had drawn eight. And, okay. And, and he was so he, know, he, he prime was time he was Derek coming. Stoltz. He would have come. The bull in the China 16. shop in this movie. Yeah. All right, tell us the rest of the story. What happened? Well, I mean, Bryant was leading, and Bryant had a good car, and, and I knew Bryant hadn't won that much since 2010 was his last victory I, you know i was just playing you yeah, know I, yeah. I you know but Derek was wanting to win and and uh Derek's a tough competitor did he put the bumper to you uh needless to say yes <laughs> okay he, when he when and he didn't back off until i was wrecked yeah uh and i knew it was as a racer we all know it's 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 an intentional get out of the way you're holding me up or i don't like you or whatever but I don't think Derek. Were you blocking for your brother? I wouldn't say I was blocking because uh, I watched the video and and I you know I was Bryant was about a car length off of me, but I may have you know been holding up. And Derek was on a mission. He was going to the front that night. Yeah. And when Derek's on a mission, <laughs> he don't care. He's a bull he, in a china shop. He don't okay. care. Yeah. And uh, and uh, you know I, when he wrecked me, I got out of my car and when they come around, I was going to rip out his MSD box. Rip wires. out his what? MSD, because I really didn't. Uh, I thought you were going to say it's tonsils or something. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, the rest is history. Uh, I came that far from being killed. All right. So if you haven't seen the video, you, you can Google it. It'll show up. But 
Mike Robertson went up to have a discussion with Derek Stoltz. He put his hands on the passenger side of the race car. And I grabbed the and you were And he was reaching in the car to try to pull the ignition box and pull the wire so Stoltz could not finish the race and win. He was going to keep primetime winning that race. And Stoltz hits the gas. <laughs> and I went flying. And Mike Robertson had the t-shirts made. Madhouse yeah. Mike. He's, he's hanging on the side of the car. Got the cape flying off the back of his uniform. And they drove a, a few yards. And then Stoltz slams on the brakes. Robertson here goes tumbling like a tumbleweed, like a bowling ball rolling for a strike, and you hit the guardrail pretty hard, man. And man, you just jumped right back up. You were mad. Yeah, I was mad, but uh, you know, it was over the next week. It's over now. Did it hurt? It looked like it oh, hurt. It hurt. Yeah, yeah, it hurt. Yeah. yeah, and it hurt. You know, it hurt my pride more than anything for being stupid. I mean, you know, just stupid. Uh, but it's over with, and you know I don't hold a grudge. I, you know, want my dad and my other family members. That's the difference between them and me. I, I can let it go, because you know I, I pay the bills, and I realize in racing if you hold a grudge, it can cost you. Um, what what did Derek Stoltz say to you? Maybe not right away, but eventually. No, I talked did, to him that week. What? How did it go? Um, you know, he expressed his point of it. I expressed mine, and and that's the way it Did was. Did he have any concern that you were okay? Yeah, or yeah, anything? yeah. Okay. I don't think. I mean, you know. I mean, Derek's not a bad yeah, guy. No, he's just man, he's Derek's misunderstood. Okay. He's a racer, man. He's, he wants uh, to he's, win. Uh, He's hardcore. He's like a modern day Jimmy Johnson. He, he will put the bumper to you and do what it needs to be done to win. That's just the kind of guy yeah, he is. I don't, and he I don't makes no bones problem. about it. I don't it. have a problem with Derek. I don't have a problem with Tommy Neal. I don't have a problem with any of them. I mean, they're racers. Everybody's got their different styles, personalities. Uh, some people use the bumper, some don't. Uh, you know, I, you know, my philosophy in racing was I would rather have a clean second than a dirty first. That's just me. That's okay. the driver that right. I was. Right. A lot of people are not like that. That's what I've tried to, you know, he had a bunch of cases uh, last year at Caraway, and he won a bunch of races down there. He could have won a lot more if he'd, have, if he'd used a bumper, but it was against Tommy Neal. Not anything against Tommy because he's six foot, 300 pounds or whatever. <laughs> that had nothing to do with it. Ron Walker time. It was not, yeah. that, that was not my point. My point was a clean second is better than a dirty first. In my opinion, he settled for second. He gained respect. Respect in racing is far greater than the wins because, you know, I've got trophies now that are collecting dust. Right. I would rather be known as a good person than a dirty driver. Not saying Derek was a dirty driver, that was just his style. Uh, I could call Derek up right now, he'd loan me anything if I needed. Tommy Neal, same way. Yeah. Tom, it's a funny story about Tommy Neal. Uh, Ryan and Tommy got into a wreck this year, and, and Tommy misjudged. It was Tommy's fault, Tommy admitted it. I had a straight rail. I went to, we were the last race of the night, and I had a straight rail that I didn't really have a lot of parts for. So. Here I am taking a tie rod in. It's, it's supposed to be straight, and it's like this. I come down the pit road, go into Tommy's trailer holding that <laughs> tie rod in. He just wrecked my son. Tommy looked at me, seen me come. Don't you come down here starting nothing. <laughs> and I said, I'm not. I need to borrow something. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what makes that's what makes racing particularly at Bowman Gray yeah. and Ace and some of the other tracks I've been affiliated. That's what makes it so cool. Is you can almost be ready to exchange fists with a guy, and then the next week, Brian, you're over this uh, trailer. We, we always used to say at Bowman Gray, we could sit on the trailer and talk about kids and life and just just have an intimate conversation. Two minutes later, we're strapping up, go out, we're ready to kill each other. Exactly, yeah. I mean, yeah. it's just a, it's the heat of the moment and emotions and... Uh, the hope. first time, now, 16 years old, right, mm -hmm. Mr. Teenager. The first time that big old red prime time shows up in your rear view mirror, knowing what had happened with your dad, what was going through your mind? Uh, I didn't really. It, he don't, he. Just kept racing, it didn't really uh, yeah. bother me. He's um, a rare breed, he doesn't, it, that was one of the reasons as a parent, when I put him out there at 14 years old, I didn't, I didn't think anything about it. I knew he could handle it yeah. from the driving aspect of it. And his personality is so low key. He, uh, 
he doesn't have the the tall is there <laughs> any of them out there that gets really gets under your skin already or no anybody <laughs> no no not really you just don't let it bother you what a cool cucumber i ain't gonna let around. him and he ain't gonna say it if he did because <laughs> I, uh, I was i was trying to nah, i was trying yeah, to reel yeah, it in getting him. he's too smart hey uh brian i want to give you a, a couple minutes to talk about your place uh you know, we all grew up in the south side of Winston-Salem, and I, I lived, you know, within walking distance of these guys for a while. And uh, back in the day, we had the old j &S Hobby Center. It was on Sprague Street in the south side of Winston-Salem. And I think you guys went there. I went there. My brother used to take me there, and we'd, we'd race slot cars in there. They didn't have the RC cars. We had slot cars. That's what we raced. And we would have the cup bodies on them, you know. We'd have Richard Petty and David Pearson and Cal Yarbrough and all those guys. And now, all these years later, you've, what's old is new again. Right. <clears throat> how, how did you get started with this, this really cool facility? We're going to show the fans a little bit of it on the video, but how did, how did you get into this? What got you into it? Well, basically, I actually started uh, slot cars uh, about 20 years ago in this same shopping center uh, when Terry King had the shopping center. Okay. Uh, two buildings down from this actual building, I rented a space from him and put the slot car track in it. Uh, we've done very well for a couple of years. Uh, and I actually moved to a different location that was a little bit bigger, and that was my downfall. Uh, you know, in business, they always say location is, is key. And when I moved, I, that, that is a true statement. So you went to a bigger place, but you just didn't have the following. We did not the have the following. We didn't have the walk-in traffic. We didn't have nothing. Uh, so we ended up just shutting the doors and, and going to some different avenues. And, uh, you know, uh, I run a car lot also during the day and uh, for the Tillys and uh, when uh, some tracks came up online for sale, you know, it just kind of popped into me, hey, let's you know, try to have a little fun again and bring something back to you know, open the doors again and that's what I've done. Uh, this time we're in a lot bigger building. We've got two tracks as far as slot car tracks. We've got a 175 foot uh, King track and a 75 foot tri-oval track, which is probably two of the biggest in North Carolina. Uh, then we actually built a carpeted RC track. Uh, the reason being King uh, RC, which is in King, North Carolina, shut down and they had a real big following. Okay. Uh, so I mean, we've kind of just opened the door. And, and this have... RC track, mm -hmm. the first time I walked in, I was like, man, that's kind of a little miniature Bowman Gray sitting over there. Was that the idea? <laughs> that is that. There is actually a couple tracks uh, in North Carolina that are a little bit bigger than mine. Uh, but when I built mine, it was supposed to be the, the, the smallest track around. And to me, and, and, and I have a lot of following with it, they love it because it is like a mini madhouse. Yeah. Uh, you know, you get. Now, I understand. You, 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 it's normally pretty calm in here, but you get a bunch of guys with the testosterone up there, man. And, it's they, just, it's and they're like all, they, they, they feel like they're really in a car and they, they start getting a little serious, don't they? They do. And yeah. I mean, we have a lot of racers uh, that come in here. We have Boo Boo Dalton, uh, Ryan Nelson. Uh, now, nobody's going to pick a fight with Boo Boo. He's so big. Shane Tuttle. <laughs> I mean, we have Marty Friedel uh, that works for me. Uh, right. Former, you know, uh, stadium Stoltz. stock racer. Ethan yeah. Stoltz. Uh, Ethan, St Ethan Stoltz comes in here and races. Uh, there's quite a few racers that come in here. And, uh, I mean, we have, you know, anywhere from kids five, six years old up to 70, 80 year old men that come in and do this. So, if, if you're looking for something fun to do with whether it's one of your kids or grandkids or if you're maybe uh you know in middle school or teenage and you got some buddies and you want to find something to do indoors that's fun that you can get started and not not spend a lot of money and you can kind of you know grow your way into it and and move your way up the ladder this would be a great place to do it oh yeah now yeah we'd love to have anybody you're more welcome to come in we have a lot of people just come in and uh, especially a lot of older people in the community those come in and look at the pictures along the walls uh they look at all the race and stuff that we have hanging up and it's you, kind of you've like got a, a lot of wrecked race cars uh being memorialized up here on the wall and some of them from your own family and i see i see sheet metal from uh boo boo dalton's car and i see some from 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 your car uh billy gregg i see Je jeff garrison billy gregg's got cars we up there we actually have a clint Brandy inscore Moore. door hanging up okay up there. clint inscore there's throwback yeah, yeah he's yeah. uh he's actually one of our weekly yeah, racers yeah, i've also. seen him in here exactly got a, got a little quarter panel Greg back Wall. there from uh crazy captain powell's brandon mm -hmm. ward car you got some pretty cool stuff hanging in here does. yep so come check them out. And Brian, I wanted to tell you on camera, I've told you off camera, thank you for allowing us uh, to come in here and film some of these episodes. It's a little cold to be shooting outside. That's for sure. And we wanted to have something with some eye candy for a background. I hope the fans have enjoyed the shows we've had in here so far. 
And uh, this guy and his wife and family have just went out of their way to uh, accommodate us, and we want to thank you for that. And we want to encourage all the fans watching this, if you're anywhere in a reasonable drive, uh, Midway is exactly halfway or midway between Winston-Salem and Lexington. It's easy to find. If you're on US 52, just look for exit 100. It's just past the precise Davidson line, and it's a big shopping center here. It's called the Midway Town Center. And you'll see Zeno Marshall's Midway Mobile Storage with those big storage containers stacked up like a skyscraper. You know you're close by because it's right next door. Come check them out. And you guys are closed on Sundays. When are you open? We're open Monday through Friday. Uh, we open at 3, uh, 3 p.m. and we usually close around 10 p.m. Okay. And then on the Saturdays, we're here from 11 to 8. Okay, gotcha. So Monday through Saturday, you can come and watch. You can also rent. Correct slot cars to, to drive so you don't have to buy anything you can just try it out see if you like it and if you do have kids and they'll get hooked if they if you come and try it you'll want to come back it's a if lot you of have fun. kids and uh, looking for a place to do birthday parties we actually do that also cool deal well again thank you for accommodating uh rattle and roll cage um i wanted to go back through you guys a little bit you've had a little bit of time now um what do you miss most about your dad being gone mike That's a, that's a loaded question. There ain't a day goes by that I don't miss him. Um, me and my dad, we spoke several times a day, and uh, I, just miss, uh, I just miss talking to him. My dad was a racer. I mean, we, he didn't talk about politics. He didn't talk about religion. He didn't talk about, uh, you know, dad was just a simple man. It was family, it was racing. And those were the only two things that really meant a lot to him. Um, you know, uh, there at the end, uh, you know, we had the opportunity through the pandemic that we were able to uh, spend the final month with him and, and take care of him. And that was pretty special. But, uh, you know, uh, man, it's, 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 it's been tough for me. Uh, I have to play mind games with me because when I start thinking about my dad, I miss him so bad, then I'll start thinking about, what have I got to do at work, or what do I need to do around the house? So I just, I just switch that to mind. Try to get your focus off. Yeah, because yeah. if I don't, I'll go in. You know, I, I, I'll I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you in the inner sanctum a little bit with me. Um, I, I had a brother. He, his name was Joseph. We all called him JW. A big old redheaded guy had a big old beard, six feet tall, about 250 pounds, and. He was a guy, we'd go to the bar and he'd sit in the corner and get a cup of ice and he would throw ice and hit people <laughs> in the back of the head and they'd turn around and look and he'd do that same person four or five times and finally that person would turn around and go, all right, who's throwing the ice? And my brother would stand up and go, I'm throwing it, what are you going to do about it? And my brother would just go looking for a fight, man. He loved to fight more than anything. And I'm exactly the opposite, man. I will, I will do everything I can from having to get into a physical yeah. altercation. Yeah. Now, I'm a big guy and you mess with me. I'll, you know, I'll put them up and I'll fight, but I don't want to fight. My brother, he was looking for a fight. And my brother was my inspiration. He would take me to the races. He took me to Rockingham, Darlington, uh, Charlotte Motor Speedway. I learned the ways of the world in the infield at Rockingham and Darlington. I'll leave it at that. Uh, but, I, man, I miss him. When, when we play the national anthem at Bowman Gray, people have, Randy, why are you wearing sunglasses? Well, I'm going to tell you, there's two reasons why I wear sunglasses. Number one, I'm looking up those really bright lights, and they hurt my eyeballs, just like these bright lights right here do. But I'm going to tell you another reason. When they play that national anthem, I immediately, I look up there to where my brother used to stand on that wall in the middle of turns one and two. He'd never sit down. He would stand up there all night. He'd go get him a Coke and something to eat, go to the bathroom. He would stand up there and watch the races all night. And he used to take me there when I couldn't, well, I wasn't old enough to go by myself. And I miss him, man. Yeah. And and I know when we crank these race cars up, you guys miss, miss your dad. Yeah, my dad was... Uh, Brian and Chase, uh, my dad, you know, he really didn't talk that much to me about how proud he was of them, but other people would come back and say, you know, man, your dad, man, he, he that's all he talks about was Ryan and Chase, Ryan and Chase. Obviously, me and Bryant, we were, we, we were low on the total ball because we sucked, <laughs> you know. No, but, no, you know, but, uh, you know, but these, these two you guys. You guys were winners. Yeah, but these two guys carried on our name were my dad and, and like Ryan said, Bryant and myself, we had to struggle for what we had. Now, you know, not saying we had turds, but, you know, we, we had full-time jobs and we took, you right. know, 30-year-old chassis and tried to make them race cars. These guys have it made. They came out with 
good equipment, so you know they should shine. Any 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 uh, any chance of you getting back in a car regularly down the road? Any any chance of that, Ryan Roberts? Oh, most definitely. You know, I took I set out some last year, um, so I'm looking forward to getting back in because. This guy right over here, he's talking that junk. So, I hear you. Uh, got so, a match race here. Yeah. Two brothers. Yeah, so I'm looking forward to get back in. I don't, I don't think you'll ever see me in a full season again, but uh, I'll definitely do some spot racing here and there. Well, just Go ahead. real quick, I put Ryan in my – I had a surgery a couple of years ago, and, uh, and we was at a racetrack, and I tried it, and I was hurting us too bad to still drive, so we decided to put Ryan in my modified. And uh, – Ever since then, his little brother's been talking. He could. He thinks he's ready oh. now. So. He, he, he's trying to make that leap. Uh, so. That's a big leap, isn't it? Yeah. He can yeah. do it. Yeah, he can do it. Ryan, um, Chase. I'm sorry. Um, four names here. So I knew I was going to do that at some point. I've done pretty good up until now. Chase, what are your goals for 2021? I know all of our goals. All of our goals is to get this pandemic behind us, where we can go back to the racetrack. And it'd be somewhere near normal and we can enjoy Bowman Gray and Ace and Caraway and Hickory and Orange County, South Boston, all the great tracks uh, around folks watching the show. What's, what's, your, what's your thought going into 2021? You, you know, you had, uh, you had 21 starts at the Madhouse under your belt. You finished in the top five. You've ran up front some. You've, you've been really smooth, consistent. You've earned the respect. What's the next move for you going forward? Uh, I definitely want to win there. Um, that's what uh, I tried last year, didn't do it. Uh, I'm just going to try this year. And um, What are you going to do differently, though? Are, are you going to be a little more aggressive? Let, let him finish, Dad. Tell me what you're going to do. Well, tell, um, tell, tell him guys what to expect. <clears throat> He's coming. I, I don't know if I'm going to be more aggressive, but uh, they're going to know I'm there. I got you. All right, there's the word. <laughs> well, well, I, go he, ahead. Uh, he actually won. We only ran six races last year, and he won three of them. I'll take that batting average, wouldn't you? Yeah. <laughs> 50%. So I told him, he could, what, you know, what he, he's got to do is don't give, don't take as much, you know. Right. you, you, you got to balance that. And yeah. he'll be a little more aggressive. But the, like I said, the, the Madhouse. You don't keep, start a war over I don't there because it doesn't I'm end well. Too, I'm too old to fight. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm getting too old. Yeah. So uh, you, you, You're you not too old to fly, though. You're pretty uh, I don't want to do that either. <laughs> Brian, <clears throat> I wanted to ask you, one of the, and I don't think I was there that night, but one of the greatest victory lane celebrations ever at the Madhouse was when Gerald Robertson, a guy that had raced modifies for 29, 30 years, okay, a guy that had had done almost anything to, to get a motor, to show up that racetrack, to get tires, spent money, frankly, guys, I'm not going to tell all his business, but he shouldn't have spent, but he wanted to go to that damn racetrack, and he was going to go come hell or high water, and he did. Right. And then he hung it up for a while, <clears throat> and he gets back in a stadium stock car. And he finally, finally, finally wins at Bowman Gray Stadium. Talk about that night. Well, I, that was probably, I, I do remember us going out on the track, and I, I actually, the one that had tears in his eyes was my brother. Uh, and I think a lot of that was because of, I was a little young. Uh, Mike was a little older than me when Dad was running Modifieds. And Mike seen how hard Dad struggled. Uh, I, of course, I heard and seen a little bit of it. Uh, as I was getting a little older, but it was more towards dad's end of his modified career. But Mike seen a lot of it when he was younger. So when we were out there and just to see dad get out and the grin on his face, I mean, you couldn't have knocked it off. What year was that? You remember, uh, you remember Mike? Uh, it was in the 90s. Uh, Late 90s, 90, wasn't it? Well, I, I, me and dad actually ran a couple races together. Yeah, well, I, yeah, because yeah, I ran with him. It uh, was 94. Four, I believe. Was okay, so I was yeah, there. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I, for, for some reason, I didn't think I was. Maybe I was. You know, thousands of races, well, they kind of tens for, of thousands. You've been around as long yeah, as they kind of run together. Too. But I know, I know that that had to be just such a great moment for it not was. only for not only you, but for the whole family. It was, and believe it or not, there was so many people out on the track. There was kids that we never even knew who they were <laughs> uh, out there getting the picture with dad. I mean, they're just. A ton of people out there on the track, and there was a ton of kids that we'd never even seen before in our life. We don't know where they come from, but they were down there to get their pictures. How, how old was he when he won, guys? Uh, that would have been, he would have been in the uh, early, late 50s, early 60s. I was thinking he uh, was. Been late, it was more than that, he was the, retirement age, yeah. yeah he, he's yeah. on up there a little bit. 60, yeah. Yeah. He was almost Junior Miller age. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He actually bought a car. 
from my uh, brother-in-law. He didn't want to race, so you know that's how Dad got in. He first that started had with to be so satisfying, though, to right. finally see him win. Yeah. Were, you, well, were you guys there? Oh yeah. But for us, me and Brian, it was more nerve-wracking. Oh yeah. Oh man, when Dad's out there. Well, Dad had a bad habit. He never driving. used radios. Yeah, he <laughs> never used radios. Wore an open face helmet. He's old school. He was very old school, and uh, he would try to put a car in a hole that nobody else would go for, but he did. And you didn't spin him out because he was the one that weighed on you. He he, he oh, was yeah. vindictive. <laughs> he was one of the vindictive I, I sort of took after him with my temper. Yeah. Mike kind of went the opposite yeah, way. I did. Me and Dad sort of had the same tempers. Yeah. yeah. Well, rattling the roll cage, we, we want to again give a shout out to anybody out there that's lost a family member because of the pandemic or just for natural causes since, since we last cranked them up at Bowman Gray Stadium. And man, we've lost some good ones and I don't want to start naming them all because I'll forget somebody. But you guys know who you are. You're very special to us. And we want to thank you guys for watching our show today. And again, this show is dedicated to all the great drivers, crew members, sponsors, and fans that we have lost since we last cranked up a motor at Bowman Gray Stadium. Our hearts go out to all the families. We're with you. And we can't wait to get back to the madhouse and crank up those motors and do what we love to do because we know that Gerald and Dink Osborne and Harold Bassett and all the other great ones that we've lost, uh, and, and I, I can't name them all, but all the great ones we've lost since we last cranked up a motor, they would want us to keep racing. Mike, That's last word. Want. They want well, I mean, as to, to echo all their sentiments, I mean, we've had a great group of support cast throughout the years. Uh, uh, Greg Marlowe, what a, what a tremendous friend. Uh, Bubba Gale, another tremendous friend. Uh, Todd Hunt, I couldn't do this without Todd Hunt. Todd Hunt was the very first person when I stepped out of a uh, stadium stock, and I didn't have a ride. Todd Hunt had a backup car, and he put me in it. I won my second time out, yep. and, I, and that cost me <laughs> thousands of dollars since. Yeah, thank but, you, Todd. Yeah, but, but Todd yeah. has made up for yeah. it in so many ways. Uh, Todd has taken a liking to Ryan. And now what he's done for Chase, it's just remarkable what I couldn't be racing without Todd Hunt. He, he's been a great friend, not only oh, to your family, but better, to Bum Gray Racing yeah. and the grassroots racing period here in North Carolina. And thank you to Jerry Hunt Super yeah, Center so and Todd just, Hunt. Uh, just the people and uh, the friendships that I've forged throughout these years uh, carry on. And uh, I'm just so thankful to have Chase's uh, team now, which we call them the Wally Heads, tremendous guys. and. Just so thankful for uh, people to, to give us their time. Very good. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. One of the racing's royal families of Bowman Gray Stadium Racing, the Robertson family. And again, I'm your host, Rattling Roll Cage, Randy Pettit. Thanks to all of our show sponsors, Turn and Burn Raceway. Thank you, Bryant, for giving us this great facility to do this. Thank you to our show producer, Lee Craft. And be sure to check out his channel, Monday Morning Racer, and hit that subscribe button. If you love racing, you'll love his channel. Over 200 great videos and interviews to check out. Want to give a special shout out to Vitamin C Shot. Look for it. If you're wondering why I have so much energy, man, all the time, it's Vitamin C Shot. You can find it in the truck stops and convenience stores, and it's going to be in a lot of your bigger retail stores very soon. Vitamin C Shot. You heard it here first. Also, a special thanks to Chip Lofton. Also, thank you to strutmasters.com. H and A Directional Boring out of Snow Camp, North Carolina, and go see our friend Terry King. Terry King, Roosters Country Store. He's got metal yard art, woodworking, pottery, the most unique gift items anywhere in the triad. They're located on Highway 66, just a short drive off the interstate in Kernersville. I'm Randy Pettit, and we'll continue to rattle the roll cage, and may all your days be race days. <laughs>